On a slightly more serious note, Aleppo, Srebrenica, Rwanda, Auschwitz, these names evoke the atrocities of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Dr. Kimmy King has devoted her career and indeed her life to reporting on tribunals that prosecute war criminals. She's here to share some of the stories of people affected and tell us about how families can rebuild their lives after the horrors of war. Please welcome Dr. Kimmy King. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Tonight we're gonna go on a journey a journey that looks at what happened when the international community dares to bend, when it stands up and finally says we will no longer tolerate what has been called the problem from hell, genocide, the systematic and intentional destruction of a people based on their race, religion, or ethnicity. We're gonna travel to two very different parts of the world, the first, the salt mines of Srebrenica in Central Europe, in Bosnia, Herzegovina. And the second, to the red hills of Rwanda in Central Africa, where most people had never heard of either until genocide breaks out in 1994 and 1995. Bosnia and Herzegovina had a long history of triumph and tragedy. Recall that that's where Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, which precipitated World War I. After World War II, communist regimes tamped down on ethnic tensions and kept them under control in order to prevent them from flaring up. And by 1984, the World Olympics are held in Sarajevo. But by the late 1980s, as communism begins to collapse from within, those ethnic tensions flare once more. And the country and the region drifts into ethnic chaos. Bosniaks, Muslims, Croats, Catholics wanted independence, but Serbs dreamed of an ethnically pure Serbia and so the civil conflict broke out. So while the wars continued and moved forward, ultimately the worst of it happened in Srebrenica in 1995, where inside approximately a one month period, about 8,000 boys and men between the ages of 14 and 60 were systematically executed oftentimes made to dig their mass graves before they were killed. Now let's turn our attention to Rwanda, where the story is similar and the song remains the same. Both Hutus and Tutsis had been under Belgian rule, but when Rwanda gets its independence in 1962, ethnic tensions flare up once more. Over the course of time, Hutus had felt that Tutsis had been given preferential treatment. You saw periods of episodic violence. Tutsis were discriminated against. Hutus felt persecuted. And so by 1990, Tutsis wanting to find their lawful place inside their country wound up engaging in a civil war and the country slipped into ethnic violence. By 1993, peace accords were negotiated, and in fact, in 1994, the Rwandan president himself, a Hutu, was on his way back when his plane was shot down in a really bad twist of fate by extremist Hutus who were angry at him because he'd agreed to power-sharing relationship with the Tutsis, and that's when the real genocide began. Over the course of 100 days, between 700,000 and a million people were systematically slaughtered in Rwanda. Our best numbers on it are approximately 800,000. To put those kinds of numbers into some perspective, think about 800,000 people being murdered in 100 days. 
you have to pretty much kill around the clock. It means that in the time my talk will take here today, pretty much the front two rows here would have been wiped out. By the time we leave the audience, by the time we leave this arena tonight, it would easily have been that this audience would have been completely been massacred. And so the end of violence meant a search for peace. Ultimately, Tutsis are able to invade the country and establish control again. But there remained a question of how the international community was going to deal with this issue of ethnic violence. How do you handle that problem from hell? And so they established two tribunals, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. From the get-go, the tribunals were criticized because they were outside the region. Remember, there were still active conflicts going on inside the region. But everyone was very cynical and said that then no way this could possibly be done. So at first, it looked like that's what was going to happen. In fact, it was so difficult in the early days of the ICTY, they had very few criminals to prosecute. The indicted war criminals were basically hiding out in plain sight in Serbia. UN troops stationed on the ground were told by their superiors, if you see war criminals coming, you're to look the other way because we don't want the UN peacekeepers to be responsible for having not prosecuted these guys. Around the world at the ICTR, the problems were a little different. The Tutsi uh, army had been able to push out the genocide heirs who had fled over the border into the Congo. The region continues to be unstable up there, by the way. And as a result, though, the issue became how are you going to be able to go after these guys in a, in a tribunal in a country that has no and very little infrastructure. How do you establish an international institution to bring people to justice when you don't even have a building that can keep the lights on? In fact, the justices in the early days often had to work by candlelight because the lights kept going on and off in the building. But justice continued to turn. And Ultimately, the international community had the will to go forward and seek that kind of international justice. The theory behind the ICTY and the ICTR is that the way you end this culture of impunity, this idea that I can kill whoever I want to kill because my people owe their people that, that's the way it's always been, what the international community said is it's time to think outside the box. We're going to bring individuals responsible for these crimes. We're going to hold the perpetrators accountable so that you can't say this ethnicity or that ethnicity. We've already seen the justice against these individuals who are responsible for the genocide. And the international community was also willing to put its money where its mouth is. In fact, one of the things about the tribunals is that they have been an incredibly costly endeavor, right? And so ultimately, however, through a series of financial incentives and sanctions, this carrot and stick approach, the international community was able to establish an infrastructure in Rwanda to hold the trials. And the ICTY eventually had criminals turned over to them as countries agreed to participate. And justice began to be applied for the first time in history. The 1948 Convention on Genocide, passed in the wake of what had happened in Hitler's Holocaust, finally had life in it, right? Commanding officers, military leaders, political leaders could no longer say, I'm not responsible. It was my troops who carried out the crimes. The war crimes tribunal said, nah, -uh, that will not stand. And those subordinates who said, I was only acting under orders, the war crimes tribunal said, uh, -uh this will not stand and you're held responsible. And most importantly, for the first time in history, even though rape has been used as a weapon of war since the beginning of the time of war, the International War Crimes Tribunal said that sexual violence, sexual enslavement, violate principles of international humanitarian law. 
so if we look at the work of the i c t y and the i c t r and you can look at it by the numbers there been sixty convictions at the rwandan tribunal for genocide six convictions at the i c t y related to shriver needs alone the numbers are impressive over five thousand witnesses at the i c t y and thirty four hundred witnesses at the i c t r have given their voice to what happens when countries slip into genocidal conflict. But what is even more important than what those numbers don't tell you is the fact that a historical narrative has been created. The witnesses in their testimony have accounted for future generations the historical record so that at some later date, no group, no ethnicity can say that didn't happen. There has been a record created of all these voices going forward that we can learn from them. So where is the journey going? In some ways, at the ICTY, the most important part of the journey is coming up. At the ICTR, we're finished with all the trial verdicts. We're awaiting the appeals judgments. At the ICTY, two of the ringleaders, really the architects of the uh, genocide at Srebrenica, we're finishing up with their trial judgments. You're going to see them pictured here in the upper corner. You see Radovan Karadic and Ratko Mladic. Mladic is in the military uniform, basically the civilian and the military leaders there at once. And you see Mladic as he's going into Srebrenica as the genocide is going to get underway, saying specifically he's going to be seeking revenge for Serbia for everything that the Turks, the Muslims, have done to him. And you also see him there listening to the witnesses testify about what happened in Srebrenica. Karadic, who's got the beard, he was hiding out in plain view in Serbia until he was captured. He too has been on trial and has been forced to hear what happened on his watch as a political leader. So in the journey going forward, what I'm going to suggest to you about the triumph of justice is that justice is not a destination. Justice is a journey, and that journey is far from over. So the ICTY and the ICTR are ad hoc. They were ad hoc tribunals for only those conflicts. The International Criminal Court is a permanent tribunal established to go after all wars and war criminals all over the world. And you see on the map in red and blue where there have been active investigations. But it, too, has had an inauspicious start. And the journey has been rocky from the very beginning. Only the areas in blue have had active indictments, leading persons to argue that, in fact, the ICC is just a tool of Western powers to go after African leaders. But the problems of the ICC don't stop there. The, one of the other biggest issues that they've had is that they've had very few trials, again, because of the capture of war criminals, but also because trials have had to be halted. Witnesses have been disappeared, and they've been murdered, indeed. So what the future looks like for war crimes and the triumph of justice depends on a number of critical factors. It depends on the willingness of the international community to continue to say we've got to think outside the box. And in order to end the culture of impunity, to end all of the regions up there where we have war crimes and genocides and crimes against humanity going on, we're going to have to have, we're going to have to have the willingness to dare to bend. Thank you. Thank you.